our next brother Lester Camp, a native Indianan, uh, to Lillian, um, formerly Lillian White, as two. Jason, whom you just met, and I think that's the most words I've ever heard Jason string together at one time in that prayer <laughs> since I've known him. And Jason's come out of his shell a little bit the last, last few years, but I appreciate him and his uh, faithful stand, and I know that he is a, a man on an island there in uh, the Denver, Colorado area, him and uh, Mike and Leslie. Leslie would be uh, uh, Lester's daughter. She is actually the lectureship Q. Abeson from Colorado because she has kind of just tuned in. Pictures too dark. Arcs, and he's be turned up, and we appreciate Mike up there as they the lectureship. And Lester has a grandchild, if you don't know that, uh, Ashley. He'll be glad to tell you all about it if you'll just ask. Anyway, we have brother uh, Camp. He has uh, stood where he is uh, standing today, where he stood when I first met him back in the mid-90s on the truth. And I appreciate men like that that stand on the truth, not changing. A couple of things uh, I will say, uh, um, if you have not subscribed to the Matters of the Faith, the quarterly that uh, Lester sends out, certainly uh, you can do that. Um, unless I just reach you through the email at your email address, uh, L Camp, or, or sign back. If you're here at the lectureship, you can sign up in the back, or you can uh, email uh, Brother Camp and uh, do that also. Another thing that I would recommend while I'm up here is is this excellent track, Guilt by Association. Again, I believe there are some of those in the back. And uh, if you're listening to that, if you have a way of getting hold of that, I would highly recommend that you read it. It's a great. And uh, it gives us the truth of the matter on Guilt by Association. Well, is it lcamp at juno.com? That's not on here, but I was going off memory, and my memory's uh, got so many holes in it now, I haven't seen to check with the source. L Camp, L K A M P at Juno, J U N O dot com, and uh, you can uh, get a subscription to the Matters of the Faith. Anyway, I'm certain that uh, Lester will do us a good job and expound on his topic, a timely topic. And I'll look at it just a moment. Oh, current views of fellowship and the church of Christ. Now, I don't know how he's going to cover that in 38 minutes because you probably, probably as many brethren you ask might get that many views. But I'm going to probably ruin this whole lesson uh, here, a uh, lesson, lecture, and say there's probably only two, two views. The right view and the wrong view. <laughs> but we'll let him sort that out when he gets up here. He'll come preach this. Appreciate so much the opportunity to be here. I have enjoyed my relationship with the Spring Congregation for a number of years. I highly regard this congregation and her elders. I appreciate you so much. Uh, you have helped me more recently uh, with matters of the faith and that in the mail when many people were making efforts to keep that from happening. I appreciate that greatly. I would like to join Michael Hatcher and commend the ladies of the congregation for the abundance and the quality of the food. Uh, you have uh, excelled greatly in this area this year. There are so many things that need to be done to make a lectureship successful, and you seem to know what to do in all of those areas, and we appreciate it greatly. I want us this morning to look at some of the fellowship issues over the years. Problems about fellowship, misunderstandings about fellowship that have occurred in the Brotherhood since almost the beginning of the church. I want us to be mindful of the fact that this is something about which many in the church have had problems for many, many years. And the problem is not a lack of clear revelation from God on this subject. People are confused 
but it's not because God hasn't spelled out those things you need to understand what goes of in terms of fellowship. Now certainly one of the first uh, congregations that problem with fellowship that we know about it in the New Testament is the Corinthian church. We're mindful of the fact that we're not practicing fellowship and withdrawal of fellowship the way they are. And Paul had to deal with that issue. You might also recall that in Revelation chapter 3, the church at Pergamos was chastised by Jesus because of their extending fellowship to those who espouse the doctrine of Balaam among other problems. Now we're familiar enough with the doctrine of Balaam to suggest to you at this time that that had to do with uh, money and the influence of money and the willingness to change the directives of God because of the influence and that problem hasn't gone away. Some today within the church misunderstand biblical concept of fellowship. Or if they do not misunderstand, they certainly misapply it and fail to practice it according to the teaching of the doctrine of Christ. Brethren, we need to learn what the concept of God-authorized fellowship is. And not only that, we need to practice that God authorized for you. As we look back over the years, there have been many times the same false concepts have reared their presence within the church and have divided the church and have caused untold problems in the church these false concepts of fellowship and other things don't seem to go permanently. They come back again and again. No false doctrine ever is completely defeated this side of eternity. And we need to understand, we need to be prepared to rise up and oppose every false way. That's why I think we would benefit greatly by reading and studying and looking from the old lectures, I mean the old debate books. Because these same errors come up again and again, maybe a little different, with a little different twist, but the same essential false doctrine. I want us to look this morning as we begin at a statement made by Brother Rod Taylor some years ago. It reads as follows. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50, Jesus told us his brethren, sisters and mothers, those who do the will of his heavenly Father, he established fellowship on terms of faith, and listen, not fleshly kin. Brothers at the time were disbelievers in his deity, according to John 7, verse 5. Obviously, they were outside the circle of his fellowship. Brother Taylor continued, there are two intense imperatives for attaining and maintaining fellowship. We may only fellowship those who have obeyed the gospel at a point in the past and who right now are walking in the light as the Lord is in the light. Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47, 1 John 1, verses 6 through 9. These are the ones, deity fellowships, and we are restricted in similar fashion. 
Now, I think this is a significant quote. Here's a man teaching the truth on the subject of fellowship. He suggests to us, and rightly so, we are to fellowship those who are in the fellowship of God, having been baptized, obedient to the gospel of Christ, are right now living the faithful kind of life God would have them to live. And we cannot extend our fellowship with God's approval past those boundaries God has already established. But there are many people who made attempts to Often, sometimes I think the goal of these false doctrines is unity in diversity. Their primary concern is not with obeying God and being faithful to God and having fellowship with the faithful. Their idea is to extend their fellowship to as many as possible. In the 1950s, W. Carl Petricide and Leroy Garrett fractured the brotherhood with their error using terminology and defining that terminology in a new and different way. They wanted us to believe that the gospel is for unbelievers only and never for the church. According to Catcher's side, and let me pause right here to say, I never met Carl Ketcherson. I haven't gone to him. He's now deceased, but I've never gone to him and discussed these matters with him. The only way I know what Carl Ketcherson taught is by reading what he wrote and the recordings of what he said. That's evidence. I have no doubt whatsoever having read this evidence that Carl Ketcherside did teach exactly what is contained with the quotations. Now, I know some of my brethren suggest that's not enough. You've got to go to the person and find out for yourself in a face-to-face -face discussion, and that's just nonsense. If we can find quotations from this individual that taught certain matters, we can know and know for certain that's what he taught. Now listen to what he said. The single of the New Testament epistles is part of the gospel. Then he said, the gospel is not a message for the saved, but for the lost. It is never addressed to saints, but to sinners. It is never proclaimed to church, but to the world. Ketcherside said that doctrine is for the church only, he stated. Our difference about doctrinal matters that do not relate to the facts of the gospel are occasions for discussion and not for division. In other words, because of these new definitions of doctrine and gospel, as long as a person believes in the facts of the gospel, that is, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we can have fellowship with anyone who believes the facts of the gospel no matter what kind of doctrinal errors they're involved in. These new definitions extended fellowship much further than allowed by the Scripture. As long as a person believed that Jesus is the Christ and was immersed in water, and the later in his life, uh, he changed that to include even those who had not been immersed. He said, fellowship is not based upon unanimity of opinion, interpretation, or even understanding of scriptural doctrine. 
it does not imply or indicate endorsement of the mission of the one with whom we may differ. Now listen, fellowship, he said, is one thing. Endorsement of the position taken by another is wholly a different thing. Now, he wanted to say, there are scattered sheep on the hills of sectarianism today. Now that ought to sound familiar to us. We may not have lived long enough to have heard Carl Ketcherside teach those things, but those kinds of things ought to sound familiar to us because we've heard others in our generation espouse the same kind of idea, maybe with slightly different terminology. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now let me make it plain that his definitions of gospel and doctrine are not biblical definitions. There is no such distinction in the New Testament between gospel and doctrine. And as he defines these terms in this different way, it leads him away from the truth further and further. And that's always the case. I'm amazed that uh, the number of false doctrines with which I am familiar depend uh, mainly upon new definitions of things. Neology, not in the New Testament. And usually false doctrines are much more complicated and harder to understand and even harder to define in the particulars than the doctrine of Christ is. Uh, people go far too far in trying to make things complicated when God has clearly stated what we need to believe and what we need to practice. A lot of what Carl Ketzer thought, along with Leroy Garrett, we might lay this passage, Amos 3, 3. Can walk together except they be three? Well, Carl says, yes. God says, no. In 1983, Rubel Shelley began teaching strange doctrines, including doctrines about fellowship that are strange from the Scripture. He began developing new terminology and began teaching essentially what we have already observed Carl Ketcherside taught. Rubel differentiated between two levels of fellowship, which he called capital letter F fellowship and lowercase f fellowship. Now, if you look in your New Testament, you won't find anything like that. But Rubel Shelley developed this idea in order to extend fellowship and allow fellowship beyond the restrictions of God's Word. According to Shelley, when one believes the gospel, repents, and is immersed for some scriptural reason, he is within that capital letter fellowship. He further stated that that capital fellowship, that capital F fellowship, demands the acceptance of the seven ones listed by Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. Well, the seven ones in Ephesians 4 are certainly applicable. But his idea was the seven ones as he himself defined them to be. In addition to these essentials, there were many members of different among those who are in that capital letter F fellowship. These matters of disagreement would include such things as premillennialism. It doesn't matter what you believe about premillennialism. Also in this category, instrumental music. It doesn't matter what you believe according to Shelley, whether you use the instrument you can worship or not. That's an optional matter and other denominational doctrines. 
So a person, as long as he has believed in Christ and has been obedient to those initial steps, the plan of salvation, he is within that capital letter fellowship. Everything else is a matter of option, is a matter of disagreement, a matter, as Petricide said, a matter of discussion rather than division. Now you might note, if you're reading along in, in chapter in the book, that I made a mistake on page 417. The last sentence, or two sentences in that paragraph, ought to read, this capital letter fellowship is fellowship with endorsement. The lowercase f fellowship is fellowship without endorsement. Shelley's concept of unity and divinity not open the doors of fellowship to everyone who had been baptized, immersed, and the further Shelley went along these lines, just like Ketcher's side, he eventually ignored that condition. As noticed by someone yesterday, Shelley now is opening his fellowship to even Muslims and praying with them. And so those that have been immersed, those who did not even know why they were being baptized, that they were being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, without their knowledge of why they were being baptized, they were baptized acceptably. And then they could practice doctrinal error in worship, even in church religion, and still be within that capital letter F fellowship. This certainly is Ketcherside doctrine in new clothes. Ketcherside's idols, the gospel determines fellowship. Doctrine does not. But turn around the difference between the two. Shelley's real purpose, I believe, was to open fellowship to the Christian church, but eventually his doctrine has led to fellowship with many others, not in the Christian church, but in many other man-made denominations, and now even to Muslims. According to Shelley, those in capital letter fellowship can and do hold very diverse views of doctrinal matters. Now Shelley's initial concept of capital F and lowercase f fellowship led eventually then to the arousal of others of a similar concept known as the poor or gospel concept. These individuals believe that the Christ is the only doctrine upon which we may not differ. Everything else is free game. Differences on virtually every other subject are allowed within that view. Now, several books were produced or written by uh, the faculty at Abilene University that uh, promoted this idea. They're listed in the book for you to notice. In 1994, Curtis A. Cates did a masterful job reviewing this particular false doctrine at the annual Denton Lectures. Listen to this statement he makes, connection. However, some preachers who were very strong in the truth and well-respected have now gone over to Ketrasidism. And some members of the church cannot bring themselves to see that such men can change. Therefore, these men are being able to deceive the hearts of those weak in the faith and or unlearned in the Scripture. Curtis A. Cates ought to read what he wrote. This is indeed the case. This follows the pattern of the warning of Jesus when he said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. The outward appearance 
or in some cases the past appearance of these individuals allows for greater deception. May it all be observed, based upon the statement of Curtis Gates, that sometimes former teachers of the truth can be deceived just like the weak in the faith or the unlearned in the scriptures. Curtis A. Gates among them. really bought into this same core bullseye gospel philosophy. He's spoken at a number of denominational occasions. On one occasion, he says, you know, I don't mind anybody knowing that I am from an a cappella tradition. Folks, I, I don't regard that as a heaven or hell issue. We preserve different traditions with regard to our music style. He's talking about instrumental music there. Instrumental music is a matter of option. He said we preserve our different traditions with regards to church polity. And that means he would allow one man rule as a pastor, physical hierarchy, women exercising dominion over men, and we could list many other things in that area. And we can also our own church organizations. I'm sure Rubel will have note with the organizational change demanded by reaffirmation, revision of elders. That would certainly be comprehended in that idea. Rubel said he called the Church of Christ our little part of the body of Christ. Well, that's not true. We're either in the body of Christ or we're not. And those in denominational bodies are not in any part of the body of Christ. They are error, in spite of what Rubel said. For all practical, practical purpose, each of these men who espouse this doctrine believe and advocate and practice doctrine which requires for the sake of fellowshipping, ignoring much, if not all, of the doctrine of Christ. Second John 9-11. By the way, Michael Hatchell already did a marvelous job uh, studying that text. Very helpful. In fact, these brethren realize their dilemma and they redefine the doctrine of Christ as the doctrine about Christ. So that fellowship with God's approval involves, according to their definition, all of those who believe that Jesus is Christ. Them, doctrines no longer matter. To them we can get along, and that simply means fellowship, with all of those who believe in Jesus. According to this doctrine, we should not allow the distinctive doctrines taught in the Testament to divide those who believe in Jesus. And we should have, therefore, unity and diversity and praise God because of it. Now, if we look back on Ketzide and Rubel and the core bullseye doctrine concept and compare these things, let's notice at least five things. Number one, the purpose of these doctrines is to expand fellowship beyond the limits established in the New Testament. Number two. In order to obtain this objective, new terminology has to be introduced. Three, the fellowship with which the doctrines began will continue to expand and include more and more as time goes by. Number four, want to be selective in his use of scripture or his doctrines begin to unravel. And number five, all these man-made doctrines are basically the same thing. There. In more recent days, since the middle of 2005, a new false doctrine of fellowship has developed and continues to evolve among us. For the lack of a better term, I shall refer to this doctrine as the indirect or insulated doctrine of fellowship. 
This doctrine has impacted the brotherhood in a catastrophic way. It affects the effects of this doctrine are far reaching. In fact, uh, appallingly so. The tentacles of this doctrine reach almost everywhere. Its advocates include many who were once very strongly opposed to liberalism, including the very doctrines we have studied every hour. Let's look at Curtis A. Cates' statement again. However, some preachers who were very strong in the truth, think about that, names will come to mind, and well respected have now gone into over to catricidism, and some members of the church cannot bring themselves to see that such men change. Therefore, these men are being able to deceive the hearts of those weak in the faith and or unlearned in the Scripture. And I might add another category of individuals who can easily be deceived, and that is those who refuse to look, look at any evidence. Brother Cates is now among those who espouse this new direct insulated fellowship doctrine, which is nothing more than another name for unity in diversity. The roots of this doctrine began to sprout, at least in noticed, when Dave Miller was brought onto the staff of Apologetic Express in spite of the protest of many who were familiar with Brother Miller's advocacy of the reevaluation, reaffirmation of elders and his false doctrine concerning marriage. And that, that goes back beyond 2005. Then when Bert Thompson was removed from the directorship of Apologetic Express because of his immorality, Miller was made interim director and ultimately director organization. Soon after Thompson's departure, a statement of support for Apologetic Express was circulated, including 60 names of men. I've listed them in the book. I think they need to be in book form so all can have access to these names. I won't go through the entire list, but let me say this. Most of these men on this list I have personally known, and most of them, I have long appreciated their work in the kingdom. I certainly hold no ill will toward any of them. In fact, I've considered many of these men to be dear friends of mine for numerous years. It breaks my heart to see what's happening to these men and to the brotherhood because of their refusal to accept the evidence and to continue to stand on the truth. I notice in this list men who are involved in works which require brotherhood support and have brotherhood influence. The list includes directors of schools of preaching, Miss School of Preaching, Bear Valley School of Preaching, East Tennessee School of Preaching. Directors of lectureships, speakers on television and radio programs, the In Search of the Lord's Way and International Gospel Hour, those who are now involved in the new gospel broadcasting network, preachers well known in the past for their soundness and willingness to expose false doctrine. But the fact remains that these men have in this document endorsed, hidden Godspeed to Dave Miller, who without question, because of the abundance of evidence, a false teacher. I don't know how we can get around that fact. That's as true as any statement can be. As Brother Taylor pointed out in the earlier quoted statement, 
Fellowship is to be based upon terms of faith and not fleshly kinship. Let me add, fellowship is also not based on fleshly friendship. Brother Taylor was abstract when he said, we may only fellowship those who have obeyed the gospel at a point in times past and who right now are walking in the light as the Lord is in the light. These are the ones deity fellowships, and we are restricted in similar fashion. We are indeed restricted in fellowship. It is sinful, according to the God, to extend fellowship to those who, because of sin, are no longer in fellowship with God, even though, listen, even though they may be our friends, even though, they may have done many good things in the past that we have appreciated. And even though we may really see a need for the particular program in which they are presently working. These 60 men either signed the statement knowing that Dave Miller was on the staff of AP, which is bad enough, or perhaps even knowing that Dave Miller was at that time interim director. In spite of Miller's well-known doctrinal errors, they signed this statement of sport. And it boggles my mind to realize that more than sufficient time has now passed to allow any of these to remove their names from this statement of support, and to remove their support fellowship from Dave Miller and the organization which he directs. But to my knowledge, none has done so. If I'd signed that statement of support and found out what I'd done based upon the evidence, I would voice it to high heaven that I had changed my mind, that I shouldn't have done that. We can get from some of these brethren now confidential statements supposedly defending their position. Initially, some of these men began to describe some form of indirect, insulated fellowship. They said such ridiculous things as they could support and fellowship AP without having fellowship with the director of AP. Well, we were smart enough in years gone by to know that that's not true. When Mr. Dobbs went off into the false doctrine of all of life as worship, we knew we couldn't support the foundation as long as Buster Dobbs was the head of it. And we ought to have enough sense that we can't support AP either as long as there is a false teacher at its helm. I'm running out of time, obviously. <laughs> I want to mention Joe Mess' statement made to Michael Hatcher in a letter relative to the dismissal or the resignation of Doug and Dave as editor and associate editor of the Gospel Journal. He said, uh, essentially, the guy was old enough to stand against fellowship with error in this circumstance of Dave Miller and Dead Express. He called them a few who are in a small but no less toxic loyalty circle, negative faction, who if they gain control will only rupture fellowship in the church even more than they already have. Now I could talk 30 minutes about that, but let me mention this. All of us have loyalties. The question is, where is our loyalty? I have loyalty to God and to his word above all else and above everyone else. Now, the circle of folks who believe that cannot be accurately described as a toxic loyalty circle. Whereas others might have loyalty to people. As uh, 
Brother Watson, I believe, yesterday described the respect of persons that to violate the fellowship ordained by God. If a person's loyalty to men, whether it is fleshly kinship or fleshly friendship, that supersedes their loyalty to God, that's a toxic loyalty. I'm sure our Gestalt therapist at that time was trying to describe us. But in essence, what he was describing was his own loyal circle. Those who refuse to accept evidence and base their decisions and their fellowships upon their friendships, or as David Brown calls it, the buddyhood, can only harm the Lord's church. And that's what we're seeing happening in church today. Well, I'm out of time. You'll have to read the rest of it in the book. I appreciate your attention. appreciate the opportunity to be here. That was a capital G good sermon. <laughs> and I hope it does much lowercase g good for those that are listening. You know, I had an opportunity to speak with one of those uh, men that signed that letter right, not too long after that came out in the Pennsylvania area. He claimed that uh, the way that he was approached with that letter was that uh, he was just said that he wanted, wanted to know if he would sign a statement saying that AP was a good work and that it should continue. Uh, he wasn't aware that Dave Miller was going to be appointed the uh, uh, director, but he's aware now. Where's his statement? Oh, that's right. I got right here, but I can't share it with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I could, but I can. You know, in a sense, I am a member of a small, loyalty circle, a circle of friends that are faithful to the gospel. And it is toxic. It's toxic to those that are teach error. And I'm glad to be a part of that circle. And I appreciate the men that are a part of it. We will be to the top of the hour for our next speaker. Remember the uh, forms up here before Brother Jim Green gets out here today. Be sure and pick those up and sign up for the CDs and DVDs and so on. And then also don't forget the book displays in the back. So we'll be here at uh, 11 o'clock.